Well, I want to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Gail Townsend. I'm the Assistant Director of Career Development at the Student Engagement Center, and we're happy to be hosting um, Mark Terosi from the Portland Incubator Experience in Portland, Oregon. He's a Whitman alum from the class of 93. And I'm going to turn it over to him. He's here for the Anjoka Vic Lecture that is an annual event that we have here. And I'm going to hand it over to Rick. Thank you. Okay. Um, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, I put this together as a very formal presentation. It doesn't have to be, okay? I'll kind of rattle through some stuff, but like, I'm very interrupt driven, so you know, kind of like, I didn't understand that, you never like, throw up your hands or get my attention or that kind of thing. So, um, basically what I want to talk to you about is how going through liberal arts education prepared me for the career I now have that I had no idea I was going to have, nor was it what I went to school to um, study for. And to my point, <laughs> I ramble a ton. If I'm rambling, like give me the cut it symbol, like do you have any questions? I use a lot. Startup world is very jargony just by design. Like any other industry, it develops its own shortcuts. And so sometimes I don't even know. I'm using jargon, so please, you know, what do you mean by that? What's going on? Or if you just want to get up and leave, I won't take that badly either. Um, so, uh, Rick Tarosi, um, class of 93. I was an English major here. Um, mostly had designs on doing that ever since junior high or high school. I competed in a bunch of like young author competitions. Um, I was in. I was lucky enough to have a school paper in high school that this was back in the 80s, late 80s, mid to late 80s. And so the Macintosh is, is still a very new thing. It's two years old at that point. And I had a journalism teacher who had managed to wrangle four or five Macs out of some grant program, and so we used those to put the newspaper together. And that, that kind of fed both this um, this uh, kind of geeky side of me as well as as well as my English major side of me. Um, talk to a lot of folks about this. Like there are a lot of folks who are like almost major, like almost minors. Like I put in all the work and I had all the credits to be a history minor or a philosophy minor, or I think also maybe even theology and perhaps German. But I didn't. Uh, I didn't really put in the effort to complete the minor, but I did have a, a well-rounded, um, uh, kind of a well-rounded experience in education. Also, outside of academics, I felt like I had a really well-rounded experience here. I played and lettered in soccer all three years as a, as a keeper. Um, one of the reasons I chose to go to Whitman was the competing college I was looking at didn't have a soccer team, and that was one of my desire. In fact, that's how much of a dumb joke I am. Um, and then uh, was recruited by uh, Professor Schmitz to play, I never touched the lacrosse stick in my life, was recruited by him to play uh, for that team. We wound up winning two championships together and I was MVP four years in a row. So I'm like really a dumb job. This is what the computer lab looked like when I went here. <laughs> We would muck around, and there, there, you have to understand there was no web. There was no everybody has. You know, very few of my peers even had computers to write papers on and that kind of stuff. I got my first email address at Whitman. It was T U R O C Z R H at Whitman. I don't think it's still active. Um, if it is, it's probably full of plenty of spam. But, um, you know, we spent a lot of time, like, Computer technology was new and exciting for us. And, and while there was no formal project, no, no formal practice around it, we spent a lot of time goofing around on the old text-based internet and trying to figure out like what that was going to be or how that was going to, to influence us. So, yeah, pretty well-rounded experience here. And I felt like I got a ton of value out of being a student. And I think in a day and age when a lot of people are, are questioning what their college is even 
necessary for some people or highlighting the fact that they're successful entrepreneurs who didn't complete college or whatever. Like, I needed college. It was something I needed to go through, both emotionally and mentally, to prepare me to, to go to the next phase. So I was really glad I did it. Um, so, mortarboard, flip the tassel, big time English major with a diploma. Now I'm going to go take over the world. <laughs> Save the Coach Lacrosse. And I was nanny. Again, blame Professor Schmitz for that. He was going on sabbatical or something and needed somebody to coach the team, so I stayed behind. And it was a club sport at that time, so I could coach and play. Um, well, he, you know, he had a kid, so you know, I just found out that kid has graduated from college and just moved to Portland. So I'm old. Um, <laughs> And did that, did that for a couple years, kind of kind of hung out in, in Walla Walla. And while I'm doing this, you know, I really, I really have this urge to put this degree I enjoy the work, and, and I'm good at it, but what I'm really looking for is I, I went through all this schooling and all this learning. How do, how do I actually, how do I actually do something with what I've learned? Huzzah, there is a literary agency is in College Place, but in Walla Walla, and I wound up getting hired there. And as you know, rose petals rained from the sky and everything was perfect because I was putting my English degree to work in an industry that I thought I wanted to be in. And I, I was not only getting to interact with amazing literature, I was getting to work with authors, I was getting to learn the business, of publishing, how back then books were made. Again, you just contextually, like there's no blogging, there's no Twitter, there's no Facebook updates, right? Like this is, you, you maybe word processing, like is there at that time. And so I feel like I did it. And that this is my, I'm, I'm here, 30 years from now, I'm gonna get the gold watch, literary agent, everything's gonna be great. You know, what, Obviously, I'm, I'm dialed for life, but <laughs> the literary world is because we have a mixed audience of poop emoji. It's, it's not, it was nothing I expected it to be. No one prepared me for how cutthroat and competitive it was. Nobody prepared me for the fact that it wasn't really driven by merit, that it was driven by other dynamics. Um, I was watching art that I loved suffer, and I was watching authors that I respected not get the recognition or, or compensation that they deserved. At the same time, I was seeing really well-marketed, poorly written stuff. See what I did. So I had, I had to stop. My dream career was over two years into it. And I was kind of done. So I played Walla Walla, and I moved to Portland. And um, I decided that this was going to be a fresh start. Um, you know, I had no idea what I was going to do. The only thing I knew I was I was not going to be literary. That's the only thing I knew for sure. I had enough of that. And Portland at that time was kind of a you know, sleepy little kind of big. Town, small city, still holds some of that, kind of some of those qualities, but it um, is not the Portlandia we have today. Um, but it was still, there was something starting to happen there that was super interesting and I was excited to be a part of. So, if, if literary, being a literary agent isn't going to be my career, the careers, what am I going to do here? How am I going to figure out how to make a living? What's the career path I'm supposed to be on? Because all I've heard throughout my entire educational process is you do all this, you get a career, and then you do that career a lot, and then you're done. Um, and that wasn't going to happen for me. No one ever told me you could start your own company either. And it was this was at a time when you know, we knew, there, like Steve Jobs was a thing, Bill Gates was a thing, but 
but it wasn't, you know, and obviously like Henry Ford or William Randolph Hearst or something. Like you knew people had started businesses at some point, but there, there wasn't really contextual like I could do this or anyone could do this. It was it was more along the lines of you thought people started businesses because they didn't have anything better to do. They got fired and laid off from their last job. It was their only option. It wasn't, in my mind, a, value, a valid career path. But what turned out is that they too needed writing and editing. And the reason they needed it is because they had products that they wanted to market. Um, the companies I would work with were generally technology driven companies driven by people who had created the actual product. And sometimes people who created a product are often the worst in person to try and describe that product or the value of that product. And so uh, my job, partly because of the, the geekiness from way back when, and, and mostly because of the English and the kind of liberal arts style of learning to which I've become accustomed, started taking on a bunch of different roles at these startups. But primarily would always start with um, with writing, it would always start with writing and editing, or or sometimes visual elements, or marketing and branding kind of things. But it was always kind of in that realm, or some form of communication and, and diplomacy among different departments. I was uh, we were talking earlier today about the title product manager, which is something I kind of fell into. Product manager is a person who talks to everybody and tries to get everybody to agree on one certain thing being the right thing to happen. So I would talk to the engineering team and say, hey, what are you building and how should we describe it? And then I create some copy and go talk to the executives and I go, whoa, whoa, whoa that's not what we're supposed to be building. Go tell engineering to build this. And so then I have to translate that into a product requirements document that engineering understood. So a lot of it was translation. Um, I had, let's see, uh, over that dozen years, I lose count, like six, seven, eight startups during that time. Um, got to go through an initial public offering with one of them, which was super exciting and provided me with plenty of stock certificates with which I nail wallpaper in my bathroom because they're not worth anything. Um, but did that a number of times. And some of the companies I would work with were just founders, just the original people who had come up with the concept who were trying to build the business. Some of them were already in one company. The one that went through the IPO, um, I was employee, like right around employee 100. By the time I left that company, um, a year later, they were 1,200. <coughs> like it was, it was a ridiculous dot com days. It was just ridiculous. Like what, it was not business. It was just throwing money around, trying to figure out what, what business was. But lots of good experiences and lots of, lots of super interesting roles. But after, you, well, after you've done something time and time again, even though you're doing it for different companies, um, even though you're doing it for different products, and we had the opportunity to like create whole new markets, which was super interesting. Um, I was at one of the early digital healthcare companies where like we were trying to change the way physicians practice and, and that kind of thing was super interesting and really fulfilling. And um, you know, one company was like using their technology to do driver's licenses, which wasn't super exciting, but it, it was interesting. But there still was something missing. So mostly because a little arts kid that like a lot of input and a lot of Things, I started mucking around in some other startup worlds, and I discovered this thing called open source. Which, if you're not familiar with the concept of open source, it's there. There are two uh, sweeping generalization. There are two general schools of software or product development. One is proprietary, which is fairly common and well known. That's your Microsoft Word or, or whatever of the world, where they build a product. A company builds a product and they sell it to you. And you are allowed to use that product as it was designed to be used. Um, open source is a far more distributed form of, of software development and technology development, 
where the crowd works together to build the product simply because they want the best product possible. Generally, the product, generally an open source product is free. Um, there's not usually a business model driving it. There's a need in the community that, that is driving that development. And this Portland, for whatever reason, at the time, was very much the hub of open source activity. We had the largest open source gathering of professionals in the world that came to town every summer. Um, you know, I, somebody I think I've been proud to become good friends with, a guy named Ward Cunningham, the guy who invented the wiki, lives in Portland. Um, a guy that I don't know I'd ever want to be friends with, but it's interesting that he lives in Portland, Linus Torvalds, who's the creator of Linux, which is the predominant open source operating system that lives in Portland. And there are any number of these really interesting projects going on. But there's one problem with all of these projects and all of these pursuits, and it's the same exact problem I encountered with the early stage startups I dealt with. It's that they're very passionate people building products that they cannot describe in English. And they cannot describe <laughs> the value that they're bringing to the market, because that's not where their creativity is spent. Their creativity is spent in building beautiful code, building beautiful products. It's not, ex it's not expensive. Right, and so I said, well, I'm not a developer that can really play in this open source space, so what do I do? How do I, how do I participate in this community in a way that is both in the ethos of the community, but also um, is providing value to these folks? And so I'm like, well, why don't I just open source my market? And so I woke up one night at 2 a.m. and I was like, I gotta start blogging about this. I gotta start blogging about what's happening in Portland. I gotta start writing about the startups that I'm seeing. Um, part of it was, uh, part of it was I just, I needed that, I needed that help. I was not writing as regularly as I could have been. I've been blogging since the late 90s. Like since you had to write code to have help. Like there were no blogging platforms, you had to like create it from scratch. But nobody ever read. Like maybe my mom read my dad, <laughs> not regularly at that. I still hold her responsible for that. Um, but I was like, I think this could work. I think it could work for the community. And I think it would also solve a much needed problem, which was um, I, as I was meeting with new startups, I would go from one coffee shop to the next where they were usually working. And I'd like on days, some days I'd have like conversations with three different people at three different coffee shops, and each of them was working on exactly the same project and had no idea that anyone else in town was working on that project or product or whatever. So part of it was just to let everybody know, hey, you should join the forces. The reason it's called Silicon Florist, I can blame on another witty. Um, Mike Rogaway, who was in my class, he's a history major. Um, he is the tech reporter for the Oregonian in Portland. And the Oregonian is the big paper for Oregon. Now, Mike has the problem that he is required to cover everything from huge tech companies like Intel to the teeny tiny startups that no one's ever heard of, and it's an impossible task for him. Um, but the, our region is called Silicon Forest, right? And I'm like, oh, that'd be a great name for a blog. And so I go out and search for Silicon Forest, and Mike's already got the URL for that blog. So I'm like, oh, curses. And then, so I'm like, well, what can I, what can I do that's like, similarly, I'm like, oh, well, you know, Silicon Forest, Portland's the Rose City, like, Silicon Forest, it makes total sense. And, like, you would not believe the amount of wedding kind of requests I get, <laughs> all this stuff coming in. Uh, a number of really interesting, like, floral arranging responses I get. But, but it is, for whatever reason, that blog struck a and it wasn't that 
it wasn't that I like saw a business opportunity there, or it wasn't that um, I, I thought there was even any way to make a business out of this. It just seemed like something that needed to be done and a way to use my skills to support a community that was valuable to me, and it took off. And the only thing I can figure out is, again, like, you know, people were similarly frustrated that they were reading all the usual publications and no one was talking about Portland startups. And here was finally something that was talking about Portland startups in the open source community. And I think the other thing is, when I was writing my own blog, there was only one person who loved every single post I put up, and that was even my mom, it was me. Right? Like, I had an audience of one. I was writing for me as my own kind of catharsis or trying to figure out what was going on. When I started writing about other people, I doubled my readership overnight, because there was me and there was the person's project that I was writing about. And they were super proud that somebody was, had recognized their product and what they were doing, and it just went crazy. So I'm kind of saying, I'm working with startups, I'm writing this blog on the side, um, you know, and everything's pretty, pretty good, stuff's starting to happen. I'm about two years into the blog. <laughs> And I wish Isaiah Mustafa was the guy who came and talked to me, but there's a guy named Rennie Gleason who um, works for a company in Portland called Wyden Kennedy. There's no reason you should know who Wyden Kennedy is unless you follow advertising and that kind of thing, but you know Wyden Kennedy's work. So Wyden Kennedy is <coughs> Nike Just Do It, they're the old Spice guy, they're imported from Detroit, Chrysler, they're, um, if you're watching TV nowadays and you still watch the form of television that has commercials, I don't know that anybody actually ever does that anymore, but if you do, uh, the new KFC reboot with, um, with the new Colonel Sanders stuff is there too. So they do really wacky advertising. They're global. They're an uh, office of 600 people in Portland, and they reach out to me because I write a blog. And, and Rennie is the global director of interactive strategy. He's in charge of all interactive strategy across all the offices of Wyden Kennedy. And I'm like, why are you, why are you talking? And he's like, I have a hypothesis that technologists and founders are just a different type of creative, that they're just expressing themselves through technology the way that Wyden Kennedy expresses ourselves through film, or through imagery, or through words. And kind of to my earlier point, that's their outlet for like creative output. And he's like, we are the largest held, largest privately held creative agency in the world. And if we want to remain at that pinnacle, we need to be in touch with what the future of creativity and technology is. And he's like, I believe that startups are the place to be figuring that out. He's like, if we just show up as Wyden and Kennedy, nobody's going to, there's respect for Wyden and Kennedy, but nobody's going to take an advertising agency seriously that they want to work with early stage startups. He's like, you seem to know what's going on. How do we, how do we work together to help the Portland startup scene? Um, how do we get Wyden and Kennedy learning from the way these people think? learning how to approach problems, learning what they're doing with technology, how to get this early, kind of early warning system on what's happening in the industry. And so that's where we came up with Pi. And Pi, at its very, very most um, rudimentary, is an experiment in how corporations work with startups. That's all it's designed to be. Um, in our in our superior naivete, we made the assumption that corporations have massive scale and are seeking innovation. And startups have a wealth of innovation and are seeking massive scale. So clearly, if you just put these two entities together, magic should happen and, and everything will be easy. Just like me becoming a literary agent. <laughs> 
And the fact of the matter is we've still been working on that. We've been working on that problem for seven years and, tr and digging into it and figuring out ways um, that corporations and startups can work together without killing one another, quite frankly. Um, and it's not easy, but I use a lot of the skills that I learned, both social and educational skills from Whitman to, to help put this program together. So we originally started, I was just, it's, it's just a mess. It's, it's a co-working space. It's so a bunch of different startups all working out of the same space. It's curated. Like, it, you can't just show up and get a desk at Pi. Um, one of the problems we are trying to solve for was Portland likes to talk about what it's going to do and all the problems it's going to solve, but there aren't a ton of people actually doing things about solving the problems. And so one of our requirements was this has to be, have to be people who are actually building things and making stuff happen. And um, so we brought them, brought people like that together, and it's 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 literally insane, the people who hide in Portland. I can't remember if it's my next slide, but like, so the initial, the, the initial iteration of Pi, this, the chief technology officer for Kickstarter lives in Portland, so he works out, of, works out of Pi. The lead engineer for Twitter has just moved to Portland, so he works out of Pi. Um, a good friend of ours gets hired at Facebook and is part of the Facebook open source like department, so he comes and hangs out of Pi. And so there's there's this there's this momentum, this starting like okay, what, what are we doing here? Like there's there's like something really interesting going on, but the agency isn't getting getting terribly engaged. Um, they're observational. We're kind of like a weird petri dish where they can kind of look in and go, oh, huh, start a how exciting. Um, but they're not really working with us. And so we went, after about 12 months, um, we went back to Biden and Kennedy and said, hey, there's this new model of helping startups that we're just starting to see spring up. It's still in its early stages. We're not really sure if it's going to work. But it's this new concept of accelerating companies. There are things called accelerators. And if you follow the startup world at all, the two we were watching most closely were a company called Y Combinator which is like Airbnb and Dropbox and like Reddit and everything came out of YC. They're the like big granddaddy. They're probably three or four years old at that point. And then the other one is Techstars. Um, they both have very different models with how they deal with companies. Um, and we didn't like either model wholly, so we kind of borrowed from both and kind of created our own recipe for how we were to deal with something. And what we do, is it's a very um, intense learning environment over a three month period. So we, um, we recruit a bunch of startups, we work with about eight to 10 per class, we only do one class a year. We give them a little bit of money, um, generally about $20,000. Um, we buy a chunk of their company for that $20,000. These days it's a very, very, very small um, especially as these valuations start to climb. And then we spend the next three months in very much what I learned from with Like it's modeled after, it's a, it's a very intense independent study for each company that tends to occur in kind of a socialized environment. So there's some shared experiences, there's some kind of like, we all show up at the lunch hall at the same time kind of experiences, but for the most part, everybody's following their own kind of major, working on their own stuff. And what we do is we we hang out with those startups a lot. And um, our job as staff is to listen for what the underlying problems are. One of the greatest challenges with the startups at this stage is they don't know what they don't know. And they can only describe symptomatic Elements. They don't recognize underlying problems because they've never been through this thing before. So we work with them and go, oh, you know, your leg hurts and you have a bit of a limp, you know, your leg's broken, you probably shouldn't walk on it there with diagnose it. Who would we get to help? You know? And then we grab mentors. We have a community of about 200 mentors who volunteer their time with us and we just do matchmaking. 
with startups and those mentors. And once that problem is either resolved or they have a path forward, we move on to the next problem, and the next problem, and the next problem, and just do that over, three, over a three month period. Now the way we got WK back engaged was, um, we said, hey, what if we took some of your clients and exposed them to what's going on here? And so we were able to bring in Coca-Cola, Target, um, Nike, We've been doing some other work with Intel, uh, and Google approached us. Again, total like weird, like, what? Google, okay, sure, yeah, you can come hang out at Pi too. And, and so they were part of what helped kind of originally fund this project as an accelerator and get it going. So we've done it, again, four years. Um, oh, Instagram on there, I, I, it's just a funny, so Instagram used to be a product called Bourbon when it first started. And, um, and Bourbon was like a Foursquare Facebook check-in kind of thing. It was like, I'm here, check-in. Um, they had a future check-in kind of thing, which was sort of interesting. It's like, I'm going to be there in 30 minutes if you want to meet me. You know, so. um, and they were building this product, and, and they were kind of watching how people were using it. And, discovered that all folks were really doing was taking photos of their coffee and like sharing it with people, but they put like a filter on it and be like, oh, my photo looks better with a filter on it. And, and they're sharing it. And they're like, why are we building this check-in app again? Because this is what we need to be building. And and their community manager was working at a pie at the time. And I'm like, and, they, and we watched him kind of convert over to Instagram. And we're like, oh, this is going crazy. Like, this is. This is amazing and it's great to watch this. And it was literally like three days before he was like, it's too insane. I have to move to the Bay Area to be with the other founders to manage this thing. So we had Instagram at five for 72 hours. <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't claim them as one of our loans, but, um, but they, it was really interesting to watch that progression happen so rapidly. And then, of course, I don't know if you know, the, uh, to tell the end of the story, Instagram got acquired by Facebook for like, $12 trillion per employee. <laughs> so, you know, it was a win for everybody. Um, the other thing that's like ridiculous to me about Pi, because it's just this little project we've been working on, and yes, it's with this global advertising agency, but it's like, no, like, that's either here or there to startups, is the fact that, okay, watch carefully, I'm gonna fill in where we get applications from. <laughs> You'll notice there's no Antarctica, and I'm really not happy about that. We're, we got to really nail the Antarctica thing. It's like we get them from all over the world. We get like 400, 500 startup applications for those eight spots. And it's becoming progressively more and more challenging to determine who the right people are for those spots. And, um, and whether Portland's right. Whether pie's right for them, and some of the things that we do, again, I, you know, I have to credit to my learning from here because it's just how I'm wired. But sometimes we tell companies that are really promising that we're not the right solution for them, that they should go to TechStars, or they should go to White or they should go to another more focused accelerator because we can't do as much for them as needs to be done. So. Despite our big ego about having every continent and practically every, company, every country um, apply, we still haven't perfected the model. We still haven't really figured out how to make it work. But we're doing okay. Um, you know, we haven't spent very much on this project. We put a lot of kind of blood, sweat, and tears into it. And these days, this number used to be far more impressive than before, like the last year or so, when companies are getting like ten million. Gates, but I'm really most proud of like the almost a thousand people because it's really changed the dynamic of the Portland startup scene. We start looking at that number of people that we've been able to, to work with and help and that kind of stuff. I don't know what I'm doing. I wish I could tell you there was some grand plan to this, but it's I, I don't. I don't know what 
what it is. Like I just I, like I keep lucking into this kind of stuff. But I have to believe that you know, maybe it's my English major allowing me to see themes starting to take place or plot lines starting to twist. Or maybe it's just the fact that what this was the this was the place where it was a really safe place to try new things and potentially fail without a lot of repercussions. I don't know what it is, but it's that, you know, it's, you know, no one goes to school if it started at the tech startup accelerator. Right? Like it's, that's, not, that's not what we do. So why, why not push it? Why not push the envelope farther? If you don't know what you're doing, and it seems to be working, why not try and do some other things if you don't know what you're doing? So Pi, we take very seriously as an experiment. Um, that's the core. It's not about how do you build the best accelerator possible. It's about um, how do you build, how do you build, continue this experiment between corporations and startups. So, you know, we pointed this process at employees. We pointed it at students. We pointed it at um, digital storytelling. This was another. Uh, Startup Accelerator I helped co-found in collaboration with Intel and the Governor's Board of Film and Television in Oregon. And the, the design behind the storyboard is, can we use the pie process to accelerate people who create content or, or pursue creative things with technology? So we have everything from video games to film to virtual reality, augmented reality. They're very different types of businesses than tech startups. Um, so we've learned a lot. Our process in this project has changed a lot from the typical pie process. Um, and it's really been this kind of proving point for us that we can take the model elsewhere and that there are ways to use what we've learned and apply it in different ways to help other people. And so. Um, Without being too revealing, we're, we're kind of trying to go back to the open source roots of Portland Pi. And what we're looking at for the next phase of the experiment is how do we take what we've learned and make it more accessible for the greater good? How do we get, I, I always, you know, anybody, I feel sorry for Gail, I'll hear him say this 20 times. And I always say that, like, Pi is unnecessarily proprietary. It's only proprietary because it's stuck in my head. And that seven years of experience and like all the things we learned are stuck. And that if we can start to document this and like any good startup, get our product in front of people sooner rather than later, then we can realize where the gaps are. We can realize where we need to build out that content. We can put together a curriculum or a cookbook or whatever not with the not with the designs that um, someone would replicate the pie process or like build another pie, but with the hopes they would take our learnings and improve upon them, like any good open source project, and then hopefully contribute back to that. So go take it, go do whatever you want with it, but at least hold it, tell us what worked and what didn't, and let's keep improving it because no one's figured this out yet. Like the the oldest the oldest accelerators of this build. just trying to create ways of building better founders. Um, so this was, I kind of wanted to tie this back. I've touched on it a few times, but like what, if I could go back and visit long-haired 1990 lacrosse playing me, like what, what would I try to impart to myself by way of knowledge um, in terms of Whitman, there's just, there's, it, career path is kind of a, it doesn't really exist like it used to. Um, technology's changed that, business has changed that. It's not that there's, it's not that there's, um, it's not that there's, there aren't career paths available, there are career paths available. I think what I'm trying to say is you don't have to take a career path. Like there's no right way you want to start your own thing, start your own thing. If you want to follow a prescribed path, follow a prescribed path. If you want to juggle a bunch of different things, do that. There's no right way to do this. Um, and 
you should have, with the education you have here and the friends you've made, you should have the courage to do that. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing risky for you at this point. Like you're in a really good spot. So please take advantage of that because you're really smart people. Some of the best early stage founders I know are the little, little arts educated people because they learn to juggle so many things. The negative side is we like to pretend we're expert in like a bunch of different subjects, which works really well for entrepreneurs as well, right? So just pretend you know what you're talking about, fake it till you make it, and everything will be cool. Um, but like the ability, I'm always amazed at the ability of people who come from a liberal, liberal arts background, at their ability to embrace the chaos that is startup activity. Because you're doing so many things at once. You know, part of you is building product, the other part of your brain is working on the business, the other part of your brain is trying to figure out how to sell it. And you kind of have to take your eye off the ball. Some things, sometimes, some things you have to, sometimes you have to juggle everything. But your brain, through this experience, is being wired to do that. And honestly, you will be bored if you try and pursue kind of like a singular path needs that kind of stimulus after this experience. So I talked to a lot of students today where risk comes up, right? Like what's the safe move after college? There is no safe move after college. Like you you just need to get comfortable being uncomfortable because it's just how it is these days. And that's a good thing. And I think it I think it provides a lot more opportunity and a lot more room to grow for folks. But there's no and you know Okay, I'm still a little mad about the literary age. And that should have worked out for me. But like, there is no, you just need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, I was trying to come up with an analogy for the biggest problem I see in startups today. And the biggest problem plaguing most startups is they focus on this, this unattainable vision of what they think their final contribution is, be that their product, service they're providing. It's the it's the kind of earth shattering, you know, magnitude kind of thing that's what they're hoping it will eventually become and they get really wrapped up in that. One of the things I really appreciated about the college experience is that's kind of your major. Like and you've always kind of got that at the back of your head that yeah I'm a, I'm going towards this major. But what you're really good at right now and what I want you to hold on to and not lose is your ability to focus on a particular assignment. You're never going, oh, I'm going to be an English major and ignoring all your assignments, right? You're like doing your assignments knowing that you're going to be an English major. And that's, that's the kind of thinking you need to go about when you're building a business or even building a career. Like it's all really small steps. So focus on the assignment. Um, we fields. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the we we were having some conversations about this. That one of my favorite things about women was that um, your peers really watch out for you, and they know when you've been working too hard, and they're like, "Nope, we're going to wheat fields tonight," or "We're going to do this," or. Honestly, I don't know how you guys play beer pong these days, but like back away, we used to play beer pong. So, um, you know, I don't get this diamond thing. You like throw it. What is that? Where did, where did that come from? Like ping pong paddles. Um, but it, you have a really supported network here. And whether you realize it or not, these are the people that are going to be your support network for probably the rest of your life. You're making some really good connections here. So, Academics is important. I can't overstate the value of the academics here or the value of the learning experience here. But I can tell you, I vaguely remember studying in the library every single night as kind of contextual reference. Like I have an analogy for that because I did it so often. But it's all these random trips to the trips to the wheat fields or sporting events or, or road trips or you know when you stay over winter break because you got to study for majors and all the other English majors and you were all like commiserating that this is awful we need to have Christmas so like I mean those are the experiences you'll remember so please take advantage of those 
Um, I know this makes no sense if you haven't taken your majors yet, but the, for me, that was the quintessential. My oral defense was the quintessential experience. And I could have foregone everything else and just had that experience, and it would have been enough. For me, that was what made the light bulb come on for me. So they're hard and difficult. Take your time, but understand that on the other side of those, that is going to be a defining moment for you as students in both the written and the oral. It's like, I just, it's really important and, and something that the college does exceptionally well. And you should be really happy to give you a chance to experience those things. Um, don't think you don't know enough. Don't think you're not expert enough. Don't think that you can't do something. What you know even with just this experience is super applicable. What you know as a potential user of a product or a potential customer of a startup, it's super valuable. Like, don't discount what you know. Um, people always come to me, they're like, why do you have a teenager that's a mentor? And I'm like, because they're your customer. They know more about how you, they want to use that product than you do. Um, like, you know, it, it, you know, you know enough. And also, this is one of my favorite ones because of uh, the cursed knowledge. Like, we, we are forever falling into these issues of, um, well, everybody knows that. Duh. No, you know that. <coughs> you think about that all the time. And you are expert in that. And you bring your own influences and, and inputs to that. And what you think is common sense is not common at all. So if you if there's something that you always test that assumption, right? Don't don't ever assume that everybody knows everything that you know. Don't assume that everybody thinks about it the way you do, because that's how creative people fix problems, is coming at it with a particular point of view and executing on that point of view. So everybody does it. That. Um, if you watch my other video, I was trying to find a little bit in my talks, because I like my um, I was going to say, it was a formative time in my life. Um, I also, just to kind of put a cap on it, it's like, this is a, for those of you who aren't familiar with Fight Club, this is, uh, this is basically a story of a guy <coughs> fighting with himself about how he wants to change his life. It's, it's, Interesting. Um, one of the things as an English major I find most interesting about it is 99.9% .9 of people you talk to, this is one of the few books that people say was better as a movie. And if Chuck had never let them make it a movie, we would have lost even that discussion point, right? Like this is something that exists in a way it was not intended to exist. Um, it's something that was changed in many ways to make it a movie and a good movie. And we got to see Brad Pitt with the shirt off, so that's all cool too. Um, but just don't don't let yourself fall into this struggle. Trust your gut. Don't think you have to be something that you don't want to be. Do what you're driven to do. And don't argue with yourself. Okay? Uh, <laughs> So it works a lot better now that I have the beard when I throw the force the other thing out there. But the, you know, there was no plan here. I've been really super lucky and I, I hope to be to continue to be lucky. I don't know that I will. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the pinnacle. If it is, I'm pretty happy that I guess gotten to talk to you about this. This is great. Um, but you know, there was no plan here. I just took risks. I used what I'd learned. I figured out obtuse ways to apply my English degree to problems I saw, um, or took advantage of opportunities because of skills I had. It's simple as that. And I never tried to create anything from scratch. I just kind of noticed when momentum was happening and kind of went with the momentum to, make, to ensure that there was some particular thing out. So, uh, I use this ancient social network called Twitter. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, 
not on the Snapchat so much, but um, you can get me on Twitter. I always welcome emails. Um, please don't be shy. If you're ever in Portland, hit me up. Let's grab coffee or whatever. Uh, basically, I'm the bottleneck for most things going on in the Portland startup scene because I didn't want to ask time to do it. So, um, Please, by all means, thank you for listening to me ramble for much longer than I expected, but nobody interrupted me, it's true. Um, and I'm happy to answer any quick questions, or we could just, do you want to just go out there? We could do questions oh, yes, there, or what do, want, question. what do you want to do? Is there any big, earth-shattering question that anyone needs answered? Well, you just set the bar pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> shattering, there you go. Does anybody have a not-so-earth-shattering question? Maybe it's a really easy one. You know, softball. Yeah. So if I had started an idea, what would be your advice for a first step? Uh, have you told anyone that idea? Uh, you people. Okay. Tell more people that okay. idea. Um, one of the one of the we we were talking about one of my failed startups was we thought we just nailed we thought we had nailed the idea and so we didn't talk about it. Like, oh yeah, we're gonna build what we need, and that's gonna be awesome. And everybody's gonna love it. And it sucked, it was horrible, and we quit doing it. So I think there's a I think there's a misconception sometimes in the industry that if I tell people my idea, I'm gonna lose that idea, or somebody's gonna steal that idea, or whatever. Quite frankly, the vast majority of people you're talking to don't have time to steal the idea, and they're not as passionate about it as you are. And what I always try and tell people is if telling me your idea is going to enable me to beat you at whatever it is you want to do, then you should probably find a new idea. Like, it's, it's probably not the right one for you to be working on. So talk as much as you can. And then equally, the most rudimentary, um, you know, kind of just like glom together version of that product you can put in front of somebody and let them use, the better, okay? Like, Done beats perfect every time, and just like get it out there, get people using it, um, you know, get people experiencing it, whatever it is. Just don't. No one remembers how bad it is at the beginning. Like if you want <laughs> something, like when I get really down on stuff, sometimes like go out and look look up like original landing pages for Twitter and Google and Facebook, and all. they're awful. Like. Twitter was like this sweaty, green, bubbly like font, and you like it was it, it's bad. But they got it out there, and people started using it. So no one will remember the bad stuff. Just get it out there. Start iterating. Start figuring out what works and what doesn't. And and inevitably, you know, maybe like the maybe like the Instagram thing. It's like you put it out there, and you're not solving the problem you thought you were solving. You're actually solving this, which is even more interesting. And so it just pays. To get Have you noticed a shift in the startup scene from wanting to be the next Microsoft to wanting to be the next company from like Google? Um, As the end goal? You know, there's it's it's a dynamic of the market that um, you know in the dot com days it was how fast can you IPO? Like how fast can you get to the street, whether you got a product or not. Just come up with a story and tell it to the public and hope that they buy your stock when it opens on that day. And um, acquisitions are a much more realistic way of um, both large companies um, ingesting innovation and small companies finding, uh, we call it in terminology, a liquidity event. It sounds awful, but it's, it, that's when you, your company that you've invested in suddenly returns money to you. Um, so that could be going public, they could be getting acquired. Private equity is another way people are starting to do that now. So instead of selling your company to another company, you sell a large chunk of it to a bunch of bankers, so you have a bunch of cash with which to work. They're not going to manage the company or anything, they're just getting capital for it. Um, but it's definitely, it's, de it's definitely changed in, towards the acquisition route. Um, and Google's not doing as much of it as they used to. Like back in the day, they would just snap things up really quickly. Um, 
but acquisitions are definitely definitely where more people lead. So, so you're driven. Some people are driven by financial outcomes, and that's what they want to do. And, and so, what they will do is identify a gap in Google Stack or in Facebook's technology or whatever, and they'll build a solution right there. So it's a no-brainer. Acquire it. Um, the downside of getting acquired is generally you have to go work for that big company for like three years if you want to get the money that they promised you when they bought your company. So if you're really into doing startups, it's sometimes it's better to just keep chasing your own dream. So, yeah, it's definitely changed. As has the ability to um, for a small group of people to do the work that used to take a massive group of people a long period of time. I can build that in a weekend and it solves a new problem. That might be a business that might go after. Yeah. Do you find that the most successful uh, founders are people that are passionate about a product or a service, or is it that they're passionate about the process itself? Um, I huh. in my experience it's generally people who are passionate about the problem they're solving because more often than not, the most successful founders are, are solving problems. They're their own target market in some way. They're solving a problem that, that they themselves have experienced. Um, there are people who are, who are passionate about the process or just like the, the fun of building a startup or building a company. They're definitely those folks, but they're often not founders. They're often brought in at a different point in the company's existence. They're like Eric Schmidt, Taylor or um, uh, trying to think who else is that. Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook. Like people who, they're the people who are like, they like the process. And they like figuring out that part of the problem. But generally, the companies with whom I feel is it's still just founder. It's, you know, the people who are successful are the opposite of the Steve Jobs archetype. They're very coachable. They um, really want feedback and input on what they're doing. They're very passionate about solving this issue, but they don't really care how you do it. They just want to solve it. Like, and, and they tend to do the best at least in the environment. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we've got. So we've got coffee yeah. and cupcakes. If you'd like to stick around and ask her some questions on your own yeah. uh, privately, um, let's see if we can to the outside. Thank you.